Hi, I'm Isabel Hoffman. And I'm Stephen Watson. We've invented Telspec, a device that tells you what's in your food. Molecular scanners for smartphones are making their way to an iPhone near you. It's hard to know what's in our food. This apple, for instance, does it have pesticides? The Sio replaces your grandmother's squeeze test. Sorry, Grandma. To tell you the best cucumber or tomato to pick. But what the heck is a molecular scanner? Is it like one of those tricorder things that Mr. Data used in Star Trek? Well, actually, yes. There's this amazing little scanner. All you do is push a button, point it at your food, and it'll give you a complete breakdown of your food and how healthy it is. Telspec is easy to use. I simply wave the Telspec back and forth, and within a few seconds, we should receive in our smartphone some information about the salad. It's totally Star Trek. Just as the fictional tricorder could give the crew of the Enterprise useful information about their surroundings, real-life molecular scanners analyze the chemical makeup of objects without the need for uber-expensive lab equipment. I'm Damien. And I'm Dwar. I'm excited to introduce Sayo. Sayo is the first molecular sensor that fits in the palm of your hand. Now I'll scan this apple. Let's see what it says. This apple has no pesticides. Now I'll scan this chocolate truffle. Ah, my tile spec tells me that this chocolate truffle has gluten as well as egg and artificial vanilla. With these apps, you can begin exploring the world around you. With any app, the more you scan, the more Sayo learns about the things you really want to know. Sayo is our latest design, and we're ready to take it to mass production. After nine months of hard work, we're ready to move to the production of Telspec. So, there were two of these devices. One of them raised about $3 million on Kickstarter, and the other raised about $300,000 on Indiegogo. So cool! It's totally like Star Trek. <laughs> That's cool. It's really cool. And you can actually train yourself, <laughs> I mean, right? this is like some Star Trek <laughs> <laughs> And it's totally bullshit. The thing is, if something like this did exist, it would make hundreds of million dollar pieces of scientific kit obsolete overnight. A non-invasive multi-component scan in seconds. All for $150. The fact that this hasn't happened, that these million dollar pieces of kit are still in use, might be your first clue as to why it's bullshit. Seriously, this piece of kit alone cost about $60,000 and it would be completely outclassed by this $150 scanner. Or for that matter, by this $250 handheld scanner. If only it were legit. And this really is a lesson how you can have dozens of scientists actually working on a project without one of them stepping back and saying, hang on a sec, even if this all works out perfectly, it's still going to be almost useless as a food scanner. Seriously, this is how fundamentally flawed the whole venture is. Now, these spectrometers claim that they work off the red end of the spectrum and off into the infrared. At that point, you start seeing absorption from various vibrations of the molecules. But that's where it all kind of falls apart. Now, it's true enough that there are some good optical windows for certain materials in the infrared, say, for instance, like polyethylene, which you can very easily see through with the thermal camera. It's almost transparent. So uh, this is just one of the nice examples. Is you get a black polythene bag, and, of course, it completely obscures things to the visible. But the infrared, it makes almost no difference whatsoever. However, most foods are an unholy mixture of many compounds and are really not that transparent to the infrared. The point is made really quite clear. If you just get an infrared camera and point it at food and you realize you really can't see what the interior of the apple looks like. There aren't many infrared photons coming out from the middle of the apple. Okay, so 
Here you've got two apples, uh, which have been in a slightly cooler room, so they appear very dark. As you can see, there's not much difference between a red apple and a green apple in the infrared. Plus, this object here has actually been in this room for some time, so it's absolutely wonderfully thermalized with everything else in the room. But of course, if I hold it for a bit, you'll see that there's fingerprints on there. And similarly, if I grab hold of an apple, you'll see there's fingerprints on it. If I grab hold of another apple, you'll see there's fingerprints on it. And those fingerprints will vanish as the apple equilibrates to room temperature. In fact, let's just take another step back for a second. The visible spectrum is about 0.3 to 0.7 microns in wavelength, where a micron is a millionth of a meter. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy the photon. So the infrared on this scale is basically everything with a wavelength longer than 0.7 microns. Infrared spectroscopy is typically done in the region between 3 and 20 microns because that's where most of the interesting molecular vibrations take place. Now there's a region between 1 and 2 microns, which is a rather special region which we'll come back to later called the near infrared. And here my thermal camera works in the range between about 7 and 13 microns. Now with a thermal camera, what you're doing is just counting up all the photons in a certain region and getting an idea of what the temperature is. With the spectrometer, in this case, we're only dealing with reflection, what you're doing is you're shining a light on something and seeing what light comes back. So an analogy here would be if you were to shine white light on something, say for instance, a green object like an apple, it's going to absorb everything else and the only light that's going to come back is green. And if you shine it on a red object, the only light that's coming back to you is red. And that's what you would be getting if you were to do an infrared spectrum of an apple. So when you take a look at a fruit in the infrared, the one thing that you notice is it's not transparent. You cannot see through the skin. And at this point, you really are just looking at the surface of the food. Nothing more. Your scanner, even if it worked perfectly, which we'll come back to why it won't later, would only scan the very top layer of your food. If you scan a hamburger, it's just going to tell you what the surface is like. You scan the bun, it'll say it's bread. You scan the burger, meat. Scan a banana, it'll tell you the composition of the skin, not the actual edible fruit inside. Yet these people advertise themselves as being able to scan what watermelons are going to be like. Imagine if there was a way to know which watermelon is sweeter. Further, if you were to go on to scan something like a curry, it'll never be able to give you the composition because all you're ever going to get is the composition of the sauce. Scan a pizza. When you scan food with Telspec, the spectrum is uploaded to our server where a program analyzes it. Within seconds, information about what's in the food appears on your smartphone. And it won't even be able to tell you there's a doughy crust underneath. Which brings us on to the other thing. Most people just care about what the food tastes like rather than its technical composition. If you're interested in the technical composition, you're almost always better getting it off the nutritional data from the label. Trying to work it out for yourself with some handheld scanner with terrible resolution is very hard work and really won't tell you much. So let's start with Telspec. It had a team of scientists. They claimed they were going to make a key fob-sized piece of kit that would instantly tell you about your food. I simply wave the Telspec back and forth, and within a few seconds, we should receive in our smartphone some information about the salad. They even went on to tell you that it would work on a rather expensive variant of infrared spectroscopy called Raman spectroscopy. They did a Kickstarter and got $300,000 way back in mid-2013. Uh, let's see how they got on, shall we? Well, of course, initially they promised this Star Trek food scanner. We've invented Telspec, a device that tells you what's in your food. When you back this project, you'll be part of a revolution for a healthier world. So please join us. Thank, Thank you. you. And they got amazing wall-to-wall -wall positive media coverage. Who wouldn't want a Star Trek food scanner? Naturally, even at this point, some of the skeptically minded among you might have been thinking, really? You're going to get all of that in something the size of a key fob? The Telspec is small, so you can take it with you everywhere. It's fast and it's easy to use. Telspec was first tested on a prototype with a large spectrometer. Then we adapted it to the nano chip. 
Yeah, their Kickstarter has it there with this, this key fob with almost no space in it is what they're going to put the scanner in. Then they said it was going to weigh 80 grams. Again, really? For frame of reference, this is what 50 grams of silver looks like. And silver is bloody dense stuff. Telspec, a device that tells you what's in your food. I present to you our first beta prototype. It's a working beta prototype. I will be demoing it today. Then we adapted it to the nanochip. It's called the Telspec food sensor. And of course, it's going to work off Raman spectroscopy. Cool. Turns out that's not really a new idea. I mean, handheld Raman spectrometers have been around for a while now. Like, say, for instance, this one, which new, cost about $60,000. Fortunately, I got this one secondhand for the bargain price of about $6,000. Let's see how it does on something simple, like say for instance, vodka, which is basically a, a water-alcohol mixture. How does this thing work? Well, it's got a laser here, and this laser is kind of focused down to a point, and that point there is where all the excitations happen. And the light is then, the light comes out of there, and is then goes back into the spectrometer. And this is the, the real key point. If the light from that point there can't get back into the spectrometer, then this whole thing is kind of pointless. So first of all, I'm just gonna show you whereabouts this, this point is. And you see there's the point. What you'll see is that it's a fairly diffuse point here. The focus is about here somewhere. And then as I come out the other side of the focus, it becomes defocused again. So where it's focused is really the critical bit. That's where you're going to get your spectrum from. Now at the moment, uh, uh, this is not too bad because the paper is reflecting a lot of the energy of that. However, if you take something that's not going to reflect a lot of that energy, you'll see that it catches fire fairly quickly. Yeah. So, there's actually quite a lot of power in this thing. Uh, you can, of course, turn down the power. It's just, it means that the scan times go up. The first thing I'm going to do is just going to scan some vodka. I'm not even going to bother uh, putting it in a vial or something. I'm just going to scan that. So, you can see that the focus of this is actually going to be within the, the um, alcohol. And we've got a good molecular signal and not fluorescence. That means that we're not losing many of those photons, um, which, as you'll see later, becomes really important that you're actually getting the photons back. And it comes straight back with ethanol and ethanol with sweetener. So let's take a look at that. Uh, we view the spectrum. Black is what we've actually got. <laughs> Red is basically ethanol. So as you can see, all the peaks line up. That's basically what it is. That's dead simple. Here's something else. This is just regular sugar. Uh, and what you'll find is if I scan this and it's not actually at the focus of the beam, I'll get almost no signal back. What I've got to do is I've got to get it right on the focus. And if I get it right on the focus for the, for the red spot, you'll get a signal almost instantly. Boom, like that. And it tells me, after a bit of thinking, what the unidentified white powder is, which is sugar. So we actually take a look at that, and it's a pretty decent match between the stock uh, spectrum for sugar and what I've just measured. Great, so let's try the same thing with an ibuprofen tablet, right? So. Uh, again, we're going to have to scan this, and I'm going to have to get that right on the point. There we go, beautiful signal. And what we find is my ibuprofen tablet is actually sugar. Yeah. <laughs> The thing is, it only scans what's on the surface, and yet the ibuprofen tablet is coated with sugar. So it tells you that it's sugar. Let's try another one that I just randomly had, which is actually a multivitamin tablet. So we go to scan this thing. 
And of course, we're going to do the same deal. We're going to get that point. Oh, there we go. Perfect. And we instantly get a, a result. of titanium for oxide. So let's take a look at that one, view the spectrum. There we go, three beautiful peaks, all of which are in our measured spectrum. So this is the real problem, is it will only tell you, if it's a liquid, it's got to be, um, it's got to allow the infrared light to get out of it. Uh, if it doesn't, it's kind of pointless. If it's a solid, you've really got to get it right on the surface. Otherwise, uh, you just don't get a signal. So let's now try it with an orange. Okay. Scan. And it's actually really quite difficult to get the... Po oh, good, we got a molecular signal. Super. Oh, excellent. It's quite difficult to see. And there is no match found for our orange. And when we view the spectra, we get this huge background, which is basically fluorescence. And we've got a few peaks in there, which might be anything. Um, okay, so let's try and actually go inside of our orange and just take a single piece out. So this is the real problem, is you just get no molecular signal. It's just all fluorescence, which basically means all the light's just getting scattered somewhere. Um, and I'm getting no useful photons back into the spectrometer. In fact, this machine pretty much excels in single component samples or maybe in main component mixtures, you know, mixtures of two or maybe three simple compounds. And that's what these things are sold for, rapid identification of unknowns like nerve agent, things like that, it would have a good go at identifying. Or explosives, uh, for that one you might want to turn the laser pad down a bit, but it would still be pretty good at identifying it, or any small, simple molecules. But once you get onto complex mixtures, like say for instance food, you're kinda screwed. Especially if you want to know what, say for instance, the content of an orange is, because you can only scan the very skin of the orange. Even more amazing, I made some inquiries about this scanner, and I asked about its sensitivity, and they were pretty honest. They said for binary mixtures, say sugar and cocaine, <laughs> their example, not mine, the detection level for this advanced Raman spectrometer was about 5%. And what did Telspec promise? Detection levels, not of 5%, but of micrograms. That's a millionth of a gram. And that's not just a millionth of a gram, that's on weekly food intake. So let's take, say for instance, one kilo of food for a week. That's starvation level food intake. They're talking about detection thresholds of parts per billion. In short, not a snowball's chance in hell. Cool, so they had a timeline for their third of a million dollar Kickstarter where they were gonna deliver these magic beans for $250. Some five years later on, Telspec now looks like this. A really low resolution version of this that doesn't cost the original $250 predicted, but one and a half thousand dollars. Yes, you can now order Telspec off their website, or should I say, uh, pre-order it with, uh, curiously enough, all pre-orders being final. Also, you can get a scan, which really doesn't tell you much about your actual food. Really, even with their working device, just to scan a simple cheese sandwich, you have to scan the bread. Today we're gonna do a quick demo on Telspec technology. So, we're gonna scan this uh, cheese sandwich um, separately. We're gonna scan the bread and the cheese separately. So the scan is now, uh, scanner is now sending information to the bread and receiving it. So that's the, the bread. So now we're going to assign how much. I think I think it's more than 50 grams, maybe okay. 100 grams. So we'll say 100 grams. Then scan the cheese, and let's just assume for the moment that their device is 100% accurate in working out the mass balance of these things, which it won't be. So again, the information is sent to the cloud, the cloud does interpretation, 
Okay, so again, we're going to assign it. We'll say 50 grams this time. You need to keep track accurately of each component. Yeah, that's going to make keeping track of what you eat so much easier. So to scan something like this cake, we would need to scan the different components of the cake. So we need to scan the, the cream cheese as well as the cake itself. And ideally, be able to contribute to the disappearance of epidemics such as obesity. Hey, here's a tip from someone who's actually been fairly successful in losing weight and keeping it off. If you want to lose weight, just eat less. It really is that simple. It doesn't require a $1,500 piece of scanning equipment, which is utterly pointless because you can't guess the exact weights of the food that you're eating. Look, in essence, the best they could have hoped to do is to match the ability of a machine like this. Which, as you've seen, even though it's an amazing piece of kit, has real limitations if you try and use it for something like analyzing food. Which brings us on to Sire, which more or less promises the same thing, which is that it will do everything. Let's say you've got some pills in your cabinet, lost the box, you don't know what they are. You could scan them with Sire and it'd tell you. The app would just pop up and say, hey, this is Advil. This is definitely one of the more impressive things that we've seen at CES. To tell you the best cucumber or tomato to pick. In an instant, it displays the food's calorie, fat, and sugar content. And it can tell real medicine from fake pills. There's a ton of stuff and people are telling us that they're going to use it for clinical trials. So to carry them around right away, it's designed more for over-the-counter and prescription medicines so you can tell exactly what's in them. As people go around zapping things with the SIO, the objects get put into a database. This then becomes a giant log of all the materials in our world. But this one is a near-infrared spectrometer rather than a Raman spectrometer. And for certain, these things also exist. So for about a thousand bucks, you can get one of these, a spectrometer that goes from about 0.2 to 1 micron. So, for a thousand bucks, you can get a spectrometer like this, which records about 2,000 points over the visible region of the spectrum, bit of the ultraviolet, bit of the infrared. And how it works is there's a fiber optic here, and whatever light comes into the fiber optic uh, goes into the spectrometer, and you get an intensity versus wavelength plot here. So the higher it is, the more intense. So if I point it directly at the light, it's auto scaling, so it, it's very smooth now because it's getting lots of photons. Uh, that's the spectra of an LED light. You know, these peaks in the in the blue, and so forth. So if I take my spectrometer, I point it at something red. You should see so you get a peak sort of in the red. If I point it at something green, you get a peak in the green. If I point it at something purple, you can see that co sometimes colours are a little more complex than your eyes give it credit for. So what we've got here is just an intensity versus wavelength plot. And the, the critical part is there are no photons down here in the infrared part of the spectrum, because you don't get much in the way of infrared photons off LED lights. So what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to have to go and get an incandescent bulb so I get lots of photons in this part of the spectrum. So that now, just off screen, is our incandescent bulb. And if I point my my spectrometer right it's saturating a bit yeah i can see that we've got lots of photons in this part of the spectrum so this is exactly what we want so we're going to shine that light onto an object and we're going to see how many photons come back but of course we've got lots more photons in this part of the spectrum than in this one so we're going to have to divide through by a sort of white spectrum as it were and so the the next sort of spectrum you're going to see is in reflection mode, where if all of the light comes back, I'm going to use a, a standard white uh, for that. If all of the light comes back, then it's going to be 100%. And if none of the light comes back, it's going to be 0%. And bear in mind, the visible is about you know, 0.4 to 0.7 microns, that sort of thing. 
So this thing will cover a bit of the ultraviolet, the whole visible spectrum, and a bit of the infrared, whilst the SIO detector only covers the red and a little bit of the infrared part of the spectrum. And therein lies the problem. This thing is crude as hell. My $1,000 spectrometer here has about a 1,000 pixels over the entire spectral range. It turns out someone stripped one of these SIOs and it has 12 pixels over the entire range. The resolution on this thing is abysmal. Although you gotta be a little careful on rubbishing things for not having enough pixel depth of color, the human eye runs on about three pixel depths of color perception. You've got a red sensor, a blue sensor, and a green sensor. And from that, you put together all of the color space that you see. But of course, it is a lie. If you actually, say, put a LED on and a fluorescent bulb on at the same time, to your eyes, they look the same. They both look like white light because your eyes are getting the same number of red, green, and blue photons from both of these lights. However, if you put a real spectrometer on them, you get a feeling for just how crude your vision is, that you can't tell the difference between these two spectra. And that's basically what you're looking at here. These are all the discrete electron transitions that are actually going on on the fluorescent coating of the fluorescent bulb. So, yeah, I mean, it's just one of these fascinating things that to your eyes, they look the same. They really do. But, not to the spectrometer they don't. So, sure, Sayo has a better number of pixel depth color than the human eye. But it's still crap compared to a thousand dollar spectrometer. Oh, and they're selling it now for about three hundred dollars. But of course, that just gets you the device. If you actually want the software that allows you to get the wavelength out, it'll cost you just shy of a thousand dollars. Almost exactly what this thing cost. In fact, SIO is quite amazing in its ability to only be able to scan food once you've told it what it is. Hi guys, Simon Brazier here, your health renegade. I want to do a little video today on this funky new gadget I've just got. It's called a SIO and it is a pocket molecular sensor made by a company called Consumer Physics. Okay, so all I need to do is go into my SIO app and you can see the different foods. There's even, you can even do your body fat on here, but I'm gonna go down to fruits and vegetables. Well, let's try produce selector. Grapes, it says. It lets me choose between different types of things I can scan. I'm gonna do the grapes right now. Yes, you don't just scan food. You have to tell it what type of food it is before you scan it. And then you get your dietary facts from the uh, scan. And of course, if you're scanning an apple. You can see on here that it's scanning and it gives you a little bit of information and this is the spectral fingerprint of that particular apple. And of course, if you were to scan a completely different type of apple, I'm sure it's gonna have an incredibly unique molecular fingerprint. Again, gonna come up to there, a little press. In the application right now. And again, this one's caught a little bit higher in sugar and it just gives you some really cool information. And again, like the spectral fingerprint of each Apple, the molecular composition of it is going to be different in everything. Are you serious, dude? In fact, hey, let me let me just try something here. Let's see how unique these spectral fingerprints are. Which brings us on to the uh, harsh questions. Like, could this spectral fingerprint say, tell me the difference between an apple and a potato? Well, let's build a near-infrared spectrometer of our own and try it. So here I've turned my spectrometer into a reflection mode spectrometer, very much similar to theirs. So the way the spectrometer now works is I've got my light here, which shines through the hole there and gives you a standard illumination on the target. And then I've got my fiber optic cable here, which is pointing directly at the sample. And that's what's going to give me the spectrum here. Now the spectrometer is currently set up such that if it's um, no photons coming in, it's got a, a straight line at zero. And if all the photons um, from the standard light are actually coming back, which is basically, I'm, I'm using a, a white cup to calibrate it. I'll take it there. 
it's going to be 100% illumination, okay? So that basically, that, that's what a standard white thing looks like. That's what black looks like. Uh, and so if I give it a red object, you'll see that um, virtually everything in this part of the spectrum is absorbed. Everything in this part of the spectrum is about, it's, it's partially reflected. If you take something that's green, um, you get a nice green sort of reflection, but also in the near infrared, a lot of the photons are coming back. Cool. So let's try this with sugar, okay? So this is just standard tabletop sugar, right? To see what we've got in the way of near infrared bands. And as we come down onto the sugar, what we actually see is there's this really quite characteristic band at 980. It's a fairly sharp absorption. There we go, beautiful. Okay, so that's the sort of near, that's the nearest I've got so far to a near infrared signal. And to show that really is sugar, you'll recall that the ibuprofen tablet was actually coated with sugar. So if we put our, if we can get our spectrometer onto our sugar pill. There we go. So again, you see the, this really quite characteristic absorption at about 980. Almost everything in this region is, is coming back. Um, and of course, most of it's coming back in the red, which is why it looks red to the eye. Okay, and just to show that we're not completely deluding ourselves, let's try our other pill, which was titanium dioxide. And here you see that there is no absorption whatsoever in the sugar part of the spectrum. Super. So what does an orange look like to my amazing spectrometer? And first of all, it's orange. Then you see that there is this absorption band in the near infrared here. It's at about, ooh, it's shifted this way from sugar. It's 970-ish, and it's also much broader. Now recall that with sugar, the absorption band was really quite sharp, and it's more 980-ish, yeah? So there is this thing that I've come across online that says that you can see through the skins of these things in the near infrared. So let's see if that's true for this portion of the infrared spectrum. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put that orange skin over that sugar and see if you can see the sugar through this piece of skin. My suspicion is no, but we will see. So actually, first of all, let's just do a comparison of what orange looks like, which, you know, the actual fruit itself absorbs a bit more strongly than the, um, the skin. The skin's much more reflective. But in terms of what the spectra looks like, they're pretty generic. I mean, there's no real difference there. I think it's just because of, you, you almost see it with the naked eye, that the light is actually going into this thing and just diffusing, right? Whereas it's mostly bouncing back off the skin. Okay, right, so if we've got just sugar, right, we get a beautiful spectrum like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the orange skin and I'm just going to put it on top of the sugar like that. And now we see what we see. And you really can't see the sugar. If I move it off to the side, you'll see what I mean. That's what the sugar looks like. And that's what the orange skin looks like. So from this experiment alone, it looks pretty conclusively like in this part of the spectrum, you can't see through the skins of your fruit. Here I've got a chocolate coated mint, which I've cut in half. Now the inside of the mint, of course, is, is mostly sugar. So if we put our mint on there, you can sort of see the absorption band at about, there's actually sort of two of them. There's a sharper one here and a less sharp one here. Right, so now the question, can we actually see that sugar through the thinnest of layers of chocolate? 
And the answer is a very conclusive no. Now I'll scan this chocolate truffle. Ah, my towel spec tells me that this chocolate truffle has gluten as well as egg and artificial vanilla. So a thin layer of chocolate will all but blot out the entire near-infrared signal uh, for um, getting a spectrum off these sorts of things. Here I've got some um, chicken, chicken meat, which as you see doesn't seem to do an awful lot. And on the other side I've got, it's, it's breaded. <laughs> Bear in mind, you're looking for, this is the fingerprint region of the spectrum according to the, uh, uh, whatever these SIO guys, <laughs> that's actually your molecular fingerprint you're looking at. Um, and here I've got a crumpet, which, uh, if anything, looks like a very, very weak form of orange. And it's quite possible that with the orange you're just looking at something like a dye in the skin. There's a sort of carotene in here or something that, you know, very small quantities of it can absorb lots of light. Right, so um, it's mostly useless, but let's try it on some fruits. So what do we got? We got a green apple and a apple that is part green, part red. So if we try on the green apple, we should of course get a nice green band. And in the near infrared, it looks almost exactly like an orange. Um, and for the red apple, hey, the green band's gone, so I can let's let's just shift from green apple, red apple, and both of them look basically identical in this portion of the spectrum. In fact, what I can do is I can take just the red apple. The apple I've got is red on one side, green on the other. So I can actually just sort of scroll it round and you should see it go from red to green. But there really isn't an awful lot of change in the near-infrared portion of the spectrum. The fingerprint of the near-infrared. All right, let's try a citrus fruit. Um, so these should be yellow. And again, <laughs> they look, yeah, this, this band is almost ubiquitous. Um, okay, bananas. Uh, yeah. Again, mostly the same. A pear, surely a pear is going to be different. Right, we've got green and brown portions of the pear. Let's try brown portion of the pear. And it's exactly the same absorption amount in the near infrared. And let's try the green portion of the pear which is kind of the same, but so I mean, okay, there is a difference in the levels of light coming back here. Um, actually, no, there isn't. And let's, for, let's just for kickles do a potato. And surprise, shock, and horror, there's the single one absorption band for basically everything apart from pure sugar, which has a, is, is the only thing that I've really come across that has this sort of characteristic signature. Well, <laughs> that's, just, that, that's just sugar. Actually, let me, let me try one last thing. So here I've got a little baby camembert sliced in half. And the first one, I'm just gonna scan the skin. It's a bit bright, so let's back it off a bit. Okay. And it's basically completely flat in the near infrared. So let's try and scan the middle bit now. And it's slightly different, but uh, you're, yeah, you really don't have a lot to go for in the way of signals in the near infrared. Right, butter slash margarine. Are you gonna get anything useful of this and yeah you do you do actually get a different band there's one at about 920 there is actually a band there amazing but you can see what the problem is that you really don't have an awful lot of signal to play with with this stuff 
Now, I know what many of you will be thinking. Hey, these people got $3 million of Kickstarter money. They must just have something way better than what I've got. Some, some amazing way of getting these superb spectral fingerprints that mean they'll be able to identify almost anything. Well, actually, that's until you watch the detail of some of the reporting, like this utterly shameless piece by Bloomberg. In an instant, it displays the food's calorie, fat, and sugar content. It's the quickest way to finding the perfect potato. Yeah, that's an amazing spectral fingerprint there. A completely flat lie. Or even better, this stunning spectral fingerprint of a dog. Even sees a future for this device in your bathroom. <laughs> you can measure teeth, you can measure saliva, you can measure hair, you can measure urine. And if you think that's bad, this is the actual current SIO website, where they show the scanner being used to get the spectral fingerprint for sugar beet and wheat which looked all but identical and under the title. Introducing the next agricultural revolution, instant animal feed analysis with revolutionary near-infrared sensor. So my reckoning is if you could tell the basic food groups apart with SIO, you'd actually be doing okay. Especially when you keep it in context that this is the spectral range of my $1,000 spectrometer and this was the spectral range of SIO. And don't get fooled into thinking that any of those bumps and wiggles at about one micron are a fingerprint of some sort. Because these are scans from a group from Tufts who evidently got hold of the developer's kit. And these are three scans of the same sample, just to give you some idea of the reproducibility of this thing at about one micron. Yet in report after report, you would find people treating this device like it was measuring absolute truth. And it was way more accurate than the actual nutritional labels. Good old American Velveeta. On the, on the label, it's 290, here it's 300. 300. So it's almost so flat it's on. Yeah, what's the fat percentage on the 23. label? 23. 23 and you're 25. Yeah, just... Oh, beautiful. That's beautiful. You tell it it's cheese, and it tells you some pretty generic soft cheese values. So, for instance, let's compare it to the king of cheeses, Roquefort. 30 grams fat instead of 25. 22 grams of protein instead of 19. Yes, this device that would struggle to tell you the difference between the king of cheeses and Velveeta. Oh, I gotta pay a thousand bucks for one of those. You know, it just bugged me that they were promising that they would detect things like pesticides and allergens, which are present in minuscule proportions, or that they could identify unlabeled drugs. When you think of healthcare, actually, it's not about what you're buying, it's actually tracking your well-being over time. Okay. And instead of sending stuff to the lab, you'll actually be able to measure it on yourself. They've also announced that there will be support for drug identification right out of the box. And no, not those kinds of drugs. So don't expect the cops to carry them around right away. Hell no. Even with my way more advanced kit, I would have struggled to tell the difference between ibuprofen and M&Ms. I'm not even so sure I would trust Sayo to tell the difference between apples and oranges, let alone heart medication or illegal drugs like ecstasy. Now, both of these companies seem to have failed to deliver to their crowdfunders and have instead just sort of set up independent companies selling their products online for about a thousand dollars a pop. But maybe the most damning thing here is if you just take a quick read of the Sayo app reviews. So on iTunes, it's got an amazing rating of one and a half stars with reviews like this. Overpriced, overpromised, underdelivered, crappy product. This is perhaps one of the worst things I've come across in my life, not just in terms of the product, but also in terms of customer service. <laughs> Promised everything, two years late, when I asked to return the product and get my money back, they said they had no obligation to do any such thing. So in summary, save your money because this company and everything about it is fraud. Really useless, expensive piece of that I can't get rid of. The ad on Kickstarter looked too good to be true. And as I realized many times in my life, if it sounds too good to be true, it most likely is. Really, there is absolutely no use for it. I had hoped it would provide some chemical composition, spectral analysis, but it does not. 
and on Google Play, it does a little better. But most of the reviews are still scathing. Completely useless device. Open dev database for free or affordable. Yeah, I think they want $600 for it. I want quantifiable spectras, not squiggly lines. App does not show wavelength or absorption slash transmission levels using data. Users are not allowed to access the data from their scans without purchasing additional licenses. Company ripped off those who pre-ordered this device with the understanding that it would do the things they advertised and it doesn't. A scientific tool that is no more than a fancy toy because they do not allow users access to their own data does not function as promised. Can't even tell what sugar is. I've yet to fully explore it, but very disappointed. I don't want something to help me select fruits. I want something that will tell me the molecular content of various substances, which is what it was advertised as. And so it goes on. The sad thing is that just like Raman spectroscopy is a real science, a real spectroscopy that you can do useful things with. So is near infrared spectroscopy. But it just so happens that most of the interesting stuff happens below about one micron, where the sensors get a lot more expensive, jumping for the entry level machines from about $1,000 to $4,000. And I wasn't keen on doing that because eh, I've spent quite a lot of money on this video so far. But there are machines that use the near infrared to actually analyze food substances. With accuracy and precision, as good or better to AOAC approved reference methods. Brooker's MPA FTNIR spectrometer is one of the most well-established products in industry for quality control and research and development applications. They're just specialized machines that focus on one type of material, say for instance, milk analysis. Not only that, but they're large machines. And secondhand go for over $10,000. Yeah, putting all of that into a key fob and selling it for 250 bucks. It almost sounds too good to be true. Scanners for smartphones are making their way to an iPhone near you. Shut up, Wesley. But what the heck is a molecular scanner? Is it like one of those tricorder things that Mr. Data used in Star Trek? Well, actually, yes. Shut, 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 shut up, Wesley. Shut up, Wesley. Shut, 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 shut up, Wesley. Shut up, Wesley. And if you think that I'm crazy for plotting $6,000 on a spectrometer here, here's a moment of zen for you. For the three or so million dollars that was raised by these crowdfunders, you could have bought 500 such spectrometers. Or if you're a typical guy who weighs about 75 kilos, it's your body weight in solid gold. That's enough to make about 75 solid gold hammers. Mm, you're cool. So if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And of course, if you really like this stuff and want to financially support this channel, I'll leave the links for Patreon below.